questions about lab? Question? So we'll check in first, and then we're coming back down here. You checked in last week. Yeah, I thought we don't check in first and come down here and then go back up. Check in what do you mean check in? And sign uh, in. I sign in and then come back down here. Okay, but you checked in last week, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, good point. Let's, uh, I think I want to meet down here at 2.30 in this room over here, which is what, 10.50, 10.51, I think. Uh, it's over here in the middle, like we were on Thursday and Friday. Okay, let's do that. Meet there at 2.30. Okay. Downstairs. Thank you for the question. Uh, then when you go up, you'll sign in. We'll get going. Um, okay, let's make sure we said everything about this table here. This is sort of a summary of the hybridization, how it affects bond lengths and bond strengths. Okay. Uh, of course, your bond angles. These are your very simple compounds. Uh, both carbons have the same hybridization. So when it refers to that, it's, it's the same uh, bond angles around really the CH bond angles. Okay. Um, Carbon-carbon bond length. Does it make sense that this carbon-carbon bond length, or maybe you call it the interatomic distance, is shorter between these two carbons? Why? Strong. All this is based on the hybrids, typically. What type of uh, what type of sigma bond is this? The sigma bond. That's a sigma and two pi, right? The sigma bond. We know pi bonds is p orbital overlapping with p orbital. What orbitals are overlapping to make the sigma bond? Anybody? Okay, SP. SP, SP, right? What, what is this up here? SP2. SP2, SP2. What is this one here? SP3, SP3. Okay. These are shorter orbitals. Two shorter orbitals are going to make a shorter bond, longer and longer. And you can't have compounds where it's mixed. You may have a compound where you have an SP bonded to an SP3. Okay. Well, what are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to an SP bonded to an SP2? Well, those are ultimately more shorter orbitals than the other scenario. Okay. Uh, everything's based on your hybrid, the length and the strength. Uh, why is it stronger? Carbon-carbon bond. Yeah, I don't like bond. It's really referring to the entire bonding between the carbons. Obviously, triple bond is stronger than double. Yeah? Double stronger than single. That's 90 kcal cal per mole. Why is a double bond not 180? Double. Why is that from sigma? Because it's not two, two sigmas. It's a sigma and a pi. I don't know if we said it, but a pi bond is weaker than a sigma. Side to side overlap is not as good. Even when we drew it, they were like way over here. It's like, are they really interacting? Side to side is not as good. Head to head is your better overlap. Okay? But this is not two sigmas. It's a sigma and a pi. But also, you've got to be careful. Do the sigmas have the same strength? The sigma bond that is in between these carbons, is it weaker or stronger than this one? It's actually stronger. So it may be, it's not, it may be like 100, but then the pi bond is like 74. So there's, there's things going on there. This has the strongest sigma bond, but it has two weaker pi bonds, so it just doesn't all add up. Uh, K-cal is usually what I would say. The CH, well, this is an SPS, and this up here is an SP3S, right? That's SP2. So which is going to be shorter? Obviously, the SPS bond is going to be shorter. Okay? Make sure you know that. Any questions about that table? We said S character. We can answer questions like below. Uh, which bond is longest? A, B, or C? Yeah, A. 
longest to shortest. So A is greater than or longer than, B. which one's next? B. B equals C. B, and that's greater than C. All depends on what type of orbitals you're using to make the sigma bond. SP3, SP3. What is the B orbitals? SP3 of this, this SP3 orbital over interacting with SP2. That's SP2, SP2. That's SP3, SP3. Because we know that's a two electron covalent bond that comes from interacting with two orbitals there. What was that? Uh, bond <coughs> linked. Okay, which, which bond is strongest? C. Lower energy orbitals make stronger bonds. Also, the shorter the bond, typically, that can usually correlate to the stronger bond. Um, let's look at other hybridization examples. Carbocations. Uh, what if I just said, hey, CH3, draw a Lewis structure for that? Well, you might want to ask some questions because that's not a good formula. That's not something's going on here. Um, for example, we can put three H's around here, but what else do we put here? Um, Well, let me just go ahead and say, we've got a cation here. CH3 cation is called a carbocation. 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 See lots of carbocations. Uh, and so, how many advanced electrons does CH3 carbocation have? Carbon has four, each H3, that's a total of seven. But since the species is positive, that means it's missing an electron. So instead of seven, it only has six. Six valence electrons. Two, four, six. There are your six. Okay. But the carbon has what charge? Well, that's not typical bonding. Yes, why is it positive? Because the carbon only is one, two, three. It's supposed to be one, four. It's missing one. It's a positive charge. Okay. This is the simplest carbocation. What hybridization do we expect for this carbon? How many electron regions around here? Three. Three. What's that going to be? SP2. SP2. Okay. Now that we know it's SP2, we know that my bond angles are really not correct. Uh, it's really, well, let's graph it first. Okay. Uh, I'm the only one around that I've ever seen graphing hybridization other than the intro day. Okay? I don't know why. It's like you learn how to do a, a math uh, equation, but after you introduce it, you just never use it again. Graphing very important. It helps you organize your thoughts. Okay? SP2. That's what we're predicting. What would that look like? We would have how many hybrids? Three. What's left over? P orbital. What type of bonds do you see the carbon making? Single bonds are sigma bonds. Car uh, sigma bond to H, sigma bond to H, sigma bond to H. Those are spread out. Trigonal planar. What's left over? P orbital. What's in the P orbital? Nothing. It's empty. Nothing there. Okay. This is your SP2 setup. This sets your geometry, and so we know the geometry is really a trigonal planar. And so we can draw these trigonal planar. All bond angles are 120, all the way around. Flat on the board, trigonal planar. What else is there? P orbital, how's it positioned? It's orthogonal or so-called perpendicular to this. Half of it's coming out towards you, the other half's going to the back, okay? If I could move the board out and put the P orbital right in the middle, okay? Half of it's, it's like this. The other half is going to the other way. Okay, and it is empty P orbital. Okay, 
This is what we would expect for this. Then we can ask this type of question. Do you expect this compound to be electrophilic or nucleophilic? What do those terms mean? What's an electrophile? First off, what's a winophile? Something that likes wine. What's an electrophile? Something that likes electrons. Okay. Now what's a nucleophile? Likes a nucleus. Well, what's the charge of a nucleus? Positive. So it likes a positive. Nucleophiles like positives, electrophiles like elect uh, electrons are negative. Uh, this species is going to be electrophilic. We love to have electrons. Electrons can come in here and fill this empty orbital. Okay. Uh, and then when we start doing reactions, this will be a reactive species, so we can form these. Okay, so I graphed the hybridization and I discuss geometry. Uh, let's look at instead CH3 anion. We redraw this here. Now since it's an anion, how many valence electrons? <laughs> Got one more than if we added them up. Table. So that would be what? Eight. Eight. I'm only showing six here. Where do you want to put the other two? Okay. By the way, this, did the CH3 cation, carbon cation, have an octet? No, it didn't have an octet. An empty orbit. Does this guy have an octet? Yeah, see, this has an octet. It also has a charge, which is what? Minus two, three, four, five. This is called a carbanion. It's an anion, which is a carbon. Carbanion. Not quite as common as a cation. Carbon would rather be positive than negative. Um, okay, what hybridization do you expect? How many regions around the carbon? Four. Four is going to be what? SP3. SP3, unless there's something going on that can't achieve SP3. We have to recognize that. Kind of some special examples. And SP3 looks like what? Four hybrids, right? Anything left over in an SP3 hybridization? No, everything was hybridized. Okay, so there's no fear of it. What type of bonds do you see? Single bond to H, single bond to H, single bond to H. What else do you see? Lone pair. Lone pair has to be in that orbital right there. What type of orbital is the lone pair in? SP3 hybrid. We graphed it. Help us organize our, our thinking. What type of lone pair is the uh, what type of orbital is the lone pair in? I'll ask that question numerous times between here and here we got two. Always know. Lone pairs will be important when we do reactions. We know what type of orbital they're in. It governs their reactivity a lot. Uh, these are spread out how? Tetrahedral. Okay, we can draw it. Uh, two in the plane. You need to get used to drawing these. One forward and one back. All right, if we do this, what's going back? It's a lone pair. Okay, now these are really orbitals, right? I mean, you can draw these in. That, that's a hybrid, that's a hybrid, that's a hybrid, that's a hybrid. This one's interacting with an H, that one's interacting with an H, that one's interacting with an H. That one's not interacting with anything. That's just a hybrid orbital sitting out there with a lone pair in it. Okay. Like right here. One of these is just a lone pair, and there's no other atom connected to it. Okay, so this is uh, working and applying. Uh, Atoms other than carbon, drug examples from the syllabus. <clears throat> this carbon right here, what's the hybridization? First off, you gotta know that there is what not shown there. There's an H there. Okay, 
So how many regions around that carbon? Four. Four. It's thus sp3. So what's the geometry around the carbon? Tetrahedral. Two in the plane, one four, one back. I see three in the plane. Boom, boom, boom. That's because it's not drawn a, a cor fully correctly. We don't always draw all the tetrahedra, uh, all of the geometry correctly. Okay? Sometimes you just want to draw the molecule up there and okay. But if you did draw it, you would have, you cut that off, you'd have the methyl coming maybe forward, and then what would be going back? And then you can draw the H going back. That's truly how it is. Okay, you need to practice these. What's the hybridization of this oxygen here? SP3, what does all that mean to you? What? Planar, it has character, kind of graph it. Okay? Hybridization of the oxygen. And can you graph the oxygen? And after the oxygen, hybridization. Well, how many lone pairs on that oxygen? Two. Two. How many regions around the oxygen? Three. Three. How many electron regions around the oxygen? Three? Three. Your book, I think, calls it something else. Uh, some fancy calculation. I don't know. But that's what they're doing. The number of regions around the I say your book, I'm talking about the Klein book. <coughs> uh, I've never seen any of the book do what Klein does with that. Uh, three regions, double bind, lone pair, lone pair. Okay, so we expect what? SP2, we'll graph that. Well, SP2 looks like this, three hybrids and a P, right? Okay, what type of bonds do you see the oxygen making? Double bond. A double bond, which is a what? One, two, one. Two, one. bond to carbon, pi bond to carbon. It's a double bond. So where are the lone pairs? They have to be here. And here's your double bond. I tried to draw this um, oxygen. Okay, terminal planar, right? Boom, boom, boom. Long pair, long pair. These are orbitals here. And this here is an orbital. Those are your three hybrids. If you want to draw them in. But this one is interacting with the carbon. What's the carbon hybridization? Also SP2. So it's the same thing. It's also a trigonal planar. Uh, well, there's its hybrid, and right here is your single bond that came from the two hybrids interaction. Um, then what's left over on the oxygen? P orbital coming out. What's left over on the carbon? P orbital coming out. And they're interacting. Okay? They both have P orbitals, they're interacting to make the pi bond, which is the second bond of the bond. So if we just look at the oxygen, you're going to plane here with a P orbital perpendicular to the plane. Okay? Of the oxygen, how many of the valence electrons of oxygen are in or pi electrons? That is, electrons of P orbitals. How many of the oxygen? Oxygen has six valence electrons. How many of those are in P orbitals? One. One. Well, pairs are not in P orbitals. They're in hybrids. Uh, okay, SP2.
think that's I think Ambien may be on the drug sheet and working with them. Cause of death, I'm not sure. Choose another one. Uh, let's, let's do a nitrogen. Anybody want to suggest one to do? Plavix. Which one? Levitra. Yeah. Which nitrogen? The, the only one? one? The only nitrogen. Uh, there's a long pair there, right? A hybridization? SP3. SP3, yeah. Uh, tetrahedral. Okay, really two in the plane, one forward, one back. Uh, let's do this guy here. <coughs> this nitrogen here. Long pair, right? What's a hybridization? SP2. SP2. Let's graph that. Uh, boom, boom, boom. The orbital left over. The type of bonds that I see. Sigma bond to carbon, sigma bond to carbon. Pi bond to carbon. That's a DB. I see a double bond to carbon and a single bond to carbon. What's left? Low pair. What type of orbital is it in? Low pair in SP2. Pretty straightforward. Okay, this nitrogen down here. Long pair? What's hybridization? How many electron regions around that nitrogen? Four. Four. You would expect SP3. But it's not. That's okay up to right this now. At uh, this time. It's SP2. Why? It's an exception. Thank you for the question. SP2. <laughs> well, here's why. Because anytime a long pair is next to a P orbital, the long pair is going to want to be in a P orbital. Assuming it can be. Uh, I usually don't say that until after we discuss why. Um, okay. You've got P orbitals next door. P orbital, P orbital, one electron, one electron. That's where that pi bond is coming from. Okay. If this is sp3, this is going to be tetrahedral, and the, the lone pair will be like this. Okay. Um, look, let's put a P orbital next door. Here's the nitrogen. And then here's the carbon, the P orbital next door. And the carbon's bonded to an oxygen, and it's got a P orbital. That's the pi bond. If the nitrogen is sp3, like that carbon, is, like that atom is there, the lone pair is going to be sticking out to the side. Okay? The lone pair is going to be sticking out there not doing anything. It turns out it's better, it's lower in energy, if that lone pair can interact with this P orbital. The only way you can interact is for it to move into a P orbital and line up with the next door. At this point, if it does this, um, this is going to, now this looks like a, si a sigma orbital. A sigma orbital is not going to interact. It needs to be a P. For it to be a P, we need to have a P. The only way to have a P is for it to be SP2. It moves there, this goes planar, I can't make it planar and you have interaction. Let's show that on the board. First, let's graph it. It's going to be sp2. That's an exception. Boom, boom, boom. P. What type of bonds do you see? Methyl. That means, that means methyl. In me, methyl. It's just a CH3, right? Okay. This is just in CH3. Two of them. So single bond to carbon, single bond to carbon, single bond to carbon, right? We use the hybrids to make the three bonds we see. So where is the lone pair? LP and P orbitals. Okay, and that's what I tried to explain here. 
lone pair is going to move into a P orbital so it can interact with the next door lone pair. And that's a more stable arrangement. So it is an exception. Yes, there's four electron regions around it. It refers to sp2. And so what we have is, if you consider everything planar, I mean, everything flat, then I can draw the P orbitals like this. Put the lone pair in a P orbital, and now we can interact with the pi system. And you get P orbitals starting to line up like toy soldiers, this is ultimately what we call resonance or conjugation. And we say that lone pair is in conjugation with the adjacent pi bone. Uh, you'll have to digest this a little bit question. Does this only happen for nitrogen? No, it happens for any atom. Hybridization, by the way, it, it doesn't matter what the uh, symbol is. We never say, is this a carbon, is it a nitrogen? We, we say, how many electrons are there? Okay. If this was a carbon, there would be no difference. Now, there'd be a charge there if it's a carbon. There's no difference in any of this discussion with atoms. It's electrons. Question. Um, if electrons usually want to stay away from each other, then why would they uh, want to stay alive? Okay. Why would the electrons of the carbon interact with the electrons of the oxygen to make this bond? In a different spin. You make a good question. Electrons repel. So why do they come together and make a bond? And their opposite spin? There's, there's physics in, in, yeah, there's underlying hardcore physics in it. Why, why are they not repelling? Because the bond is sort of, okay? So that's kind of what you're getting at. We're, we're, we're making bonds here. The overlap of the P with the adjacent P is sort of like bonding. So that would be a type of Vanderbilt? No, not Vanderbilt. I call it pi bonding. It's called resonance. Okay. But we're not going to cover that until test three. Said we're going to build on the residents. Some books will actually lie to you, and in, in chapter one they'll say this is SP3, but over in chapter 12 they'll start calling it SP2. Wow. Okay? I'm setting the foundation for residents. Do you understand the exception? The take home statement is anytime a lone pair is next to a P orbital, the lone pair is going to be what? It wants to be in a P orbital if it can. There's sometimes some weird exceptions where it can't. Usually it's where it looks sp3, but it, it's actually sp2. Rarely will it ever look sp2 and move to sp because of some structural restrictions. Can you show us another example? You need to do examples, need to ask more questions. You're not going to learn it right here. Question? No, I was saying, like, can you show us another example? Where yeah, we'll see plenty of examples. Um, what do you think about the hybridization of this oxygen over here? SP2. Four regions, SP3. No, it's not. Well, it's not. not because anytime a lone pair is next to a P orbital, lone pair is going to want to be in a P orbital. Okay? This is SP2. Oxygen's SP2. Graph it. Okay? Uh, there's plenty of these in the workbook. There's ones on the warm up page where it says graph hybridization, etc. Start doing problems. Questions? Um, when there's two lone pairs? And you want it to become SP? No, it's not going to do that because the adjacent carbon only has one P orbital. Um, let's pretend this is oxygen. Both of these are lone pairs. Only one is going to be able to line up. You can't expect both of them to line up with the adjacent pair. Can you? I mean, how are they both going to line up? It, it ain't going to work. Now, if the adjacent carbon had two p orbitals, maybe one can line up with that p orbital and the other one can line up here. Then this is going to be sp, and the and this one would be linear. Sp linear. Two p orbitals. Now you have the line up, line up. You rarely see them. 
impossible. It's just real. Uh, like I said, never ever really going to ever go SP. Okay. Good questions. Um, what about the nitrogen in? Um, Let's see if we can find another one here before we move on. What's, how about the nitrogen of uh, Tylenol? What's hybridization? What do you envision going on here? SP2, long pair, and what type of orbital? P. P orbital. Lining up with the adjacent. It's actually got P orbitals on both sides. Okay? It's like you have. Um, P orbitals on both sides. You can't see. Stand up. Okay? Now, if, now in between, if you have tetrahedral, Lone pairs are going to be going boom or boom. Instead, this guy is going to want to line up, and, and this wants to become put in a p orbital and make the rest trigonal planar. Boom, boom. But now the lone pair can interact with the neighboring p orbitals, and you have toy soldiers lined up. And that's called pi bonding or resonance or conjugation. Got to work on this. I'm not going to learn it right now. Uh, Okay, please look at these. You can always be on the lookout for this. It can be, again, it doesn't matter what the symbol is. It can be a fluorine, it can be a phosphorus. Although sometimes things with D orbitals do a little bit different bonding. Okay, uh, functional groups, VUS, and on the back was the hybridization one. Okay. Both of those I'll send answers to those by email at some point. If you're working on those. There's also questions in the workbook, those have answers in the workbook. Are you talking about the worksheet Warm ups. Okay. Front and back. Yeah. Those questions I'll send answers to. Okay. Ah, uh, so there's the key exception. Uh, a word about MO theory. What we're doing here is called valence bonding theory. Okay? Everything we've done, the atom still owns its orbitals. They have just become hybridized, and now we call it like an sp3, but it's still an orbital that belongs to the carbon or whatever. When you do molecular orbitals, you don't, the atom no longer owns orbitals. The orbitals are spread over the entire molecule. Uh, MO theory is perhaps more definitively correct. Uh, there are problems with valence bonding. For example, oxygen. If you show a good Lewis structure for just oxygen, it will look like this, O2. Oxygen is standard bonding. Low pairs, two bonds. Problem is, oxygen is paramagnetic. Something can only be paramagnetic if it has unpaired electrons. I don't see any unpaired electrons. So it doesn't jive with what we see in the lab. That's because this is a failure of this type of model, valence body. Oxygen is really a diradical, it has two unpaired electrons. That is shown by like the orbital theory. Okay? So guess what? If we, if we came in here and started you guys on like the orbital theory, your head would explode. <laughs> okay, so we lie to you a wee little bit, but guess what? We're not lying much. It's just occasionally what we're talking about doesn't doesn't hold up. Okay, I think we're now ready to move on to polarity. That's a handout. Physical properties warm up. Please be looking to work those questions, getting them answered as we go through the material. At some point, I'll send out a key to those. If you need to struggle with the question, find the answer yourself. Just look at the key, you're not going to be learning. Front and back there. Polarity of covalent bonds.
okay, bonds can be polar or not. Hydrogen is one uh, sigma bond, nonpolar. Okay, the electrons here are very equally distributed between the two nuclei. So polarization in the species. On the other hand, ACL is not. We know chlorine is more electronegative, it means it's going to want to pull the electrons towards it. Why? Well, as explained in GenChem, chlorine has all those uh, protons in the nucleus which pull the electrons towards it, and you result in polarization. And so we get something that looks more like, um, like this, right? The electrons in the bond are closer to the chlorine, yeah? And so instead of uh, just nicely here, that chlorine's more like this, okay? <laughs> Still bonding, but just sort of greedy. And so we get polarization, the electrons are more towards this end of the, of the species. Uh, and we can show that with like a partial plus and a partial negative. Or the dipole arrow, either way, illustrate that. More, more minus charge here on this end than this end. We call that polarized. Since it's polarized, it will now respond to like a polar field. And uh, it has thus properties uh, which are, come from its polarization. And in physics, you'll need to talk more about how it can respond. And that polarization in chemistry is measured in like Debye, okay, which is like the amount of charge versus the separation of the charge. I'm not going to cover that, but you may talk about that in physics. For us, we just want to be able to identify bonds as polar or not, show dipole. Carbonyl, very common arrangement, is polar. Carbonyl is polar. Uh, the oxygen pulls electrons towards it, leaving it partial minus and partial plus. And so we, we say that that carbon is electron poor due to the polarization. Now there's no formal charge here. These are partial charge. Um, so just difference in electronegativity. And of course our discussion will build. So, interhalogens, I, uh, Cl, chlorine, more electronegative, chlorine's going to pool. And so, then we could say questions like this. Uh, of the iodine and the chlorine in this molecule, which one's more electrophilic? Mm -hmm. Chlorine's more electronegative. Which one's more electrophilic? In this bonding situation, the iodine. Okay. Since chlorine pulled the iodine's electrons, the iodine's over saying, hey, I, I don't have any electrons. I would love to have some. I know, but isn't chlorine proving more love, pulling them towards them? Because they're the Philip for me. Right? Chlorine's more electronegative. Okay. I'm just introducing the term electro, uh, electrophilic. Okay. So that's that's Sometimes okay. terms, it, uh, rationalize enough and I don't know if I don't get that. On the other hand, terms are terms. And the iodine, because it's electron poor, because the chlorine is so electronegative, the iodine is called to be electrophilic. In this situation. Uh, okay. And so saying electrophilic, I could say this. Which halogen is more partial positive? These two. Also the bromine, because chlorine is more electronegative and this the bromine is partial positive, it's partial negative. The bromine is more electrophilic. Now if chlorine was bonded to a fluorine, the chlorine would be more electrophilic. Or electron poor. Okay? Uh, the language of organic chemistry. I don't know where I've seen that before. Oh, organic chemistry as a second language. Uh, this is in the library my name is course. Okay. Let's see what the chapters are here. Uh, how to study. That's a good chapter. Uh, line bond drawings. How to draw a line bond. Mistakes to avoid. Identifying formal charges. Chapter 2. Resonance. Uh, ooh, a long pair next to a pi bond. 
Chapter 3, acid-base reactions. I like that. Chapter 4, geometry. Uh, okay. Over here, CH3Br. Bromine's pulling. That's the carbon. How did that partial plus end up there? <laughs> well, there you go. It's partial plus. That was the bromine pulling. We can show it that partial negative. Carbon is... I don't see it there. Down the road, we'll say that carbon's electrophilic. Uh, typically, you do not consider a dipole between C and H. There's a slight difference in electronegativity, but it's usually ignored. Just forget about it. Don't consider it. Nonpolar. Consider nonpolar. Okay, let's put this uh, together. Most of that was looking at bonds. I'm sorry, H2O. H2O has two polar bonds, right? Oxygen pulling, making it partial minus, partial plus. Oxygen actually pulling. Is this right? Here we have two dipoles. And any molecule larger than just two atoms, and you have multiple dipoles, you have to consider how they maybe cancel each other out. These are vectors and vector addition. Are these vectors canceling each other out? As shown, it looks like they would be equal and opposite. The problem is this is not correct geometry. Is this what's the correct uh, geometry? Two openers. Yeah, it's really a tetrahedral. Um, and thus we have. Two in the plane, uh, one forward, one back. Or if you just want to put the lone pairs there, but we know that this bond angle is 109.5, not linear. And so, are these canceling each other out? Are they equal and opposite? No. You have a dipole that's sort of coming this way, and a net dipole that comes up through here. This is vector addition, and that dipole through here, where this being the negative end, that makes sense, because this is where the electrons are. And this being the positive end. And so we have a more of a molecular dipole, sometimes called a molecular dipole moment. Uh, and that's the, that's the thing that really governs the uh, properties of the molecule start talking about dipole interactions. So really, we just did H2O there. H2O, polar or not? Polar, because the dipoles that are there do not cancel. What about CO2? Is it a polar molecule or not? We need a correct Lewis structure. We could get this here. Center carbon is sp. You should be able to come up with that. And thus it's linear. Enjoy it linear. We have dipole oxygen pooling. But those are equal and opposite. And so they cancel each other out. And CO2 is nonpolar. Now, the carbon is electrophilic, electron poor. But it's nonpolar because if you put it in a situation where polarity would do something, it wouldn't do anything. For example, if you put it in an electric field, it would not torque. Uh, this is partial minus, partial minus, partial plus. If you put it in an electric field and you had minus here, Would this move? Uh, I think it better to say plus. So I can torque it. If that was plus up there, would this go up? Would this go up? 
this is not going to go up because this wants to go up. Basically, I'm getting into physics, and when you start talking about physics, are thinking about well, what can a molecule do here? How does this physics discussion relate to this? This is beyond what I would ever talk about here. It's nonpolar. So it's not going to behave as polar when you start doing things that, uh, like, like electrical fields. Okay, let's see what's next. Is it SO2? Yep. Yeah. Okay, SO2. Polar or nonpolar? You gotta have a Lewis structure so you can see the geometry of the dipoles, the individual dipoles. Uh, is it linear or what? The three atoms there, are they a linear arrangement or what? Oh, I see so. Valence electrons. Sulfur six, oxygen six, six. Eighteen. Eighteen? Uh, you could put oxygen in the middle, but typically this is probably sulfur in the middle. Uh, oxygen, okay, 18, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, uh, I need to put two more up there, where, where do I have to put them? Sulfur, uh, does sulfur have an octet? No, I'm going to ask this, this to bond. And I can show this. This is a resonance structure. So if I have an octet, two, four, six, eight, everything has octets. Oxygen is minus. It's charge of sulfur. Plus. Actually, plus. Don't forget expand its octet. We could actually ask the oxygen to move in again. And we can get double bond to O, double bond to O. Right? Which looks like CO2. Problem is the sulfur's got a long pair. And since it has a long pair, how many regions around the sulfur? Three, double bond, double bond, long pair. And so the geometry of our discussion is going to be trivial planar unless we talk about D rules. A good structure would be like this, trigonal planar. It's not linear. Since it's not linear, What's the dipole? Towards oxygen? Oxygen more electronegative? Are these going to cancel? No, it would only cancel if it's linear. For two. Okay, I just sort of you my thought process, okay? Uh, SO2 is polar because that lone pair makes it nonlinear, etc. CCL4. Okay, let's set the stage for next time. Please do the remainders there. You need to know the correct geometry and then see the individual dipoles and then see if they cancel out or not. Sometimes you may have four dipoles and they all cancel. Ionics. But then please look ahead. We'll hit the physical properties hard next time. Please also be looking to do problems on the warm-up pages in this handout. And we need to think about having a quiz at some point. Anything else, guys?